Uh, as we look across the state, I can identify at least five water markets that are spe specific and peculiar. Um, second largest state in the United States, second most populous state in the United States of the 25 largest cities in the United States, six of them are here. Um, those are the numbers, uh, Houston, Dallas, uh, you know, those, those sorts of um, places, okay? Uh, nearly six times the population of uh, British Columbia. All right. The couple of markets that I'd like to talk about, the Edwards Aquifer market, very interesting, very recent market. Uh, Lower Rio Grande, a surface water market, kind of old school. Okay, let's talk about the uh, Lower Rio Grande first. Uh, several hundred thousand acres of irrigated land. Uh, here's a map of the various irrigation districts that are uh, pulling water from the Rio Grande. Um, we had a drought in the 1950s, a confused system of water rights at the time. All of these places sued one another, uh, hundreds of suits. The suits all were collapsed into one, took 15 years to resolve. A judge took a look at this and said, no, this doesn't make any sense. He installed a new system that was finished in 1970, about 15 years after the commencement of the suits. At that point in time, we have a new system of water rights. Those water rights were transferable. Instantaneously, we have a market. That market's been in operation for 40 years. Okay, the basic uh, way the market works, it's a correlative rights system. Some people call that a proportional, can you call that proportional system? Um, it's a, a sharing of, of the uh, water. There's two tiers in this particular sharing system. The municipal rights have a higher priority. Um, they're basically quantitatively firm because of the higher priority. Ag rights are theoretically quantitative, but they're actually shares of what's left over after municipalities get their water. Right? There's very strict monitoring. Um, and enforcement. If you're going to pump water, you have to call the water master's office and order the water. Right? In part, that's because there's a nine-day transit time from an upstream reservoir down to where the water's pumped from, and so it's got to be released from the reservoir for you to be able to pump it. Okay? The way this works, every month, tallies are done. Everybody who has a water right has an account. Any water use that you've done during the month is subtracted from your account. All right, so the accounts are already done. They compute new inflows into the two reservoir systems. They know how much additional water is available now. First thing that happens, all the municipal accounts are automatically filled up to their capacity, exactly how much water they, they are entitled to for the coming year. So at any point in time, municipalities always have one year of water guaranteed. Um, the rest of the water, what's left over, is divvied up across the agricultural water right holders. So they basically get shares of what's left over. Okay? Transactions are allowed. Most of the transactions historically have been transactions from irrigation to urban use. All right? So uh, in this case, a theoretical share of an ag right becomes a firm municipal right when you transfer water from um, ag to urban. For leasing, intersectoral leasing is not allowed because that would defeat the two-tier system, um, but intrasectional, intrasectoral leasing is very common. So lots of um, water marketing in the form of sales and leases should mention that this has enabled tremendous population growth. Um, this particular area, these four counties have been growing at the rate of three and a quarter percent per year for the past 40 years. That's a lot of population growth, okay. Um, no res new reservoirs as a consequence of the accomplishments of this water market. 80% of the water rights now dedicated to urban use were irrigation rights 40 years ago. Yet, agriculture is still very viable there. It's using uh, approximately 80% of the water. We have a very diverse agriculture there, by the way. Uh, citrus, cotton, vegetables, sugarcane, all kinds of uh, things, right? 
Little fanfare, very few people even know that the system's there. It just happens to work. Right? So that's a surface water market. Okay, groundwater law. I want to mention a little bit about groundwater law because I think our system of groundwater law in Texas is like yours. Basically, anybody who's a landowner is allowed to pump groundwater. Isn't that the case in, in British Columbia? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's problematic when water is scarce, and it's particularly problematic when surface water and groundwater interact with one another, as is the case in the Okanagan. Uh, so that's been problematic, and as a result of it being problematic, we had a big issue with the Edwards Aquifer, and we had boarded use of this system for a single aquifer. And um, as we did that, we created a water market. We knew we were creating a water market when we made this change. Okay, here's the Edwards Aquifer right there, kind of a weird system. Um, rainfall or rivers uh, crossing this plateau basically don't sink in to the soil until they hit this blue area. This is the outcropping of a, limestone, a highly fractured limestone formation. As water travels over that area, it goes underground. Um, the small rivers that cross this area, some of those rivers just completely disappear when they touch this um, recharge area. The water subsequently goes underground and flows in this direction. San Antonio is approximately here and was originally settled there because of the spring flow there. Um, we have uh, major springs that continue to operate here at Comal Springs and San Marcos Springs. Basically, the aquifer is a huge interbasin transfer project that moves water from western basins to eastern basins. Okay. Um, here's a cross section of the aquifer, and you can kind of Following this blue line here, you can kind of see how the aquifer is. You can see these major springs where the, where the water outcrops. All right. Here's the problem. Um, recharge to the aquifer is highly stochastic. You can see the drought of the 50s here. One of the major springs, Comal, actually ceased to flow for a time right there. Okay. You can see it's highly stochastic. Right. Average Average um, um, recharges on, on the order of 600,000 acre feet. San Antonio is entirely dependent. The seventh largest city in the United States is entirely dependent on the Edwards Aquifer for its water supply. Uh, pictures of a couple of springs, Comal Springs on the left, San Marcos Springs on the right. They don't look so big there. Uh, here's another. Um, a lot of recreation occurs here. Uh, what happened here is, we had a suit. The Sierra Club sued, um, saying that uh, the endangered species that exist in these springs would be extinguished if the spring flow was ever to stop, which would be true. And given the current state of, of use, the springs will eventually stop. Because Endangered Species Act is a matter of federal interest, that suit was filed in federal court. Federal judge eventually said, yes, that is correct. That's going to happen. It's being mismanaged. He gave the Texas legislature one year to make a change. Otherwise, he was going to make the change. Okay? What the Texas legislature decided to do is install a transferable rights system. Right? Did that in 1993. Um, this is starting from a situation of common property. So in this case, we're converting common property to private property, and there's a lot to get done. You've got to adjudicate water rights. In this case, we're talking about a lot of water rights, most of it agriculture, by the way. The target was to uh, get down to uh, 450,000 acre feet of water rights, to tone that down to 400 by 2008 because it was thought that that level of water right might be consistent with those springs continuing to flow even under drought situations. 